I, uh, I will welcome you. Welcome, my name is Jacqueline Friedman and I'm the program director of the Center for New Words. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization dedicated to creating spaces and places where women's words matter. We operate out of Boston and this is part of our national election speak out tour. This is what women want. Um, this event and this project grew out of a, a sense we were getting from women around the country um, as the primaries were coming to a close, a real frustration with the way that gender was being discussed in the media and in the campaign, but how women's voices were, were not actually being listened to. We were talking all about gender and women, but we weren't listening to women. Um, and we decided, because that's what we do, that we ought to do something about that. Um, and so the campaign uh, has two main components. Uh, one is a series of live speakouts that we kicked out in Boston right before the conventions and have been holding in each of the debate cities the night before the debate. Hence, we are here in your fine, fine city where they have live music at the airport. <laughs> I'm telling you, Nashville is on my, my A list of airports at this point. Um, and I've been in a lot of airports recently. Uh, and in, in addition to the live speak out tour, we have an online component at thisiswhatwomenwant.com and I want to really encourage you all to pick up some of our bookmarks and give them to your friends because you and everybody around the country, women can speak out um, online about what they want. We're also going to be posting speak outs from here online and at that website not only can you speak for yourself but you can also vote on other women's ideas about what they want from the next president so that the most popular ideas rise to the top and we can see, we can start to get some sort of a consensus of what we as women want. Um, so that is a little bit about the project. Um, I'm going to at this point ask if anybody has something on them that looks anything like this, that they, you know, well I think you know what to do. <laughs> yes. Okay, before I go any further, I uh, must thank a number of people and Chief among them is Stacy Nunley. Uh, Stacy, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we uh, we lucked out when when Stacy decided to to sign the Margaret Cunningham Center onto this project. Um, she's been tireless working on putting this together and helping us find great speakers and get the word out and get the beautiful food and the venue and the co-sponsors and all of that and the signage that got you here and the parking lot and all of that stuff. So. Um, I, when I say that I couldn't have done this without Stacy, I, I quite genuinely mean that. Thank you, thank you, Stacy. Um, this project is also co-sponsored by uh, Gender Matters and Project Safe at the Women's Center, the Department of Anthropology, the Office of Leadership and Intercultural Affairs, the Black Cultural Center, the Vandy Feminists, Women and Gender Studies, and Vanderbilt University as a whole. So that's amazing support from Vanderbilt and I want to give thanks to all of those departments and organizations uh, for helping to make this happen. And you should thank them too when you get a chance. <laughs> they provided the lovely food. Um, so here's how this is going to work. Um, we have invited a few featured speakers to kick us off because nobody really likes to be first at the mic. Um, and we asked some women in Nashville who have a lot to say about what they want from the next president to kick us off. Um, so I'm going to introduce each one of them briefly and then they're going to speak. And then it's going to be your turn um, to come up here, uh, sign a little bitty waiver saying that you know that this is a media event and so you're speaking on the record. <laughs> and then say whatever you want uh, from the candidates, from the media, and from the president. Um, so I'll go over the ground rules of the open mic part a little bit later. We're going to get started now with our featured speakers. And our very first one, uh, who better to start with than Betty Clark Nixon, who came of age in Nashville in the 1950s and became a civil rights activist and feminist once she began to get a grip on what went wrong in that unique decade. She's a longtime political activist, former Metro Council member. Uh, in that role, she helped to organize the neighborhood movement in Nashville. She ran for mayor of Nashville uh, and was director of the Mondale Ferraro campaign in 1984. Uh, state director of the re-election campaign for U.S. Senator Jim Sasser. Um, chair of the Davidson County Election Commission during the 2004 presidential election on the board of Planned Parenthood of Middle and East Tennessee. Former chair of the board of Nashville Electric Service. A retired assistant vice chancellor right here at Vanderbilt. 
um, and the winner of numerous awards given to women for achievement and service to other women, including the Athena Award and the Academy of Women of Achievement. And now she's going to grace us with her wisdom. Please welcome Betty Clark Nixon. Marzak doesn't sue me for infringement of copyright, and it is respect. Uh, respect for America, and I want our American government to respect all of our citizens, regardless of race, sex, country of origin, personal beliefs, or lifestyle. I want America to respect other nations and the international laws that are the basis of our world peace. Respect is what allows people uh, to work together, whether they agree with each other or not, and whether they like each other or not. As an activist, I had the privilege for more than 50 years of working with all kinds of Americans, and I know Americans to be honest, hardworking, generous people. We take care of our families, we help our neighbors, we enjoy community life. We work hard at our jobs and we strive to better ourselves. But as a nation, we have lost moral authority. And the most dramatic example of disrespect for international law and codes for me is that when we condone torture and ignore the most basic human rights, we lose moral authority and invite retaliation on our sons and daughters. I want a president that respects international law and conventions and sets the highest example of moral leadership for America and the world. I also want a president who respects our right of privacy. As an American, I don't feel the need to be protected from myself. I think I can figure out what I want to read, what I want to see, what I want to look at on the internet, what I want to see in the theater, what I want to hear in the lecture hall. And I think that my family is completely able to deal with that issue with our children. So I want free speech. I have five adult children, four of whom are women. I want them and their children, I want America to protect their reproductive rights. I trust my children to be able to make personal decisions about their sexuality, about abstinence, about contraception, and about abortion. It is our job as a family to teach right and wrong, and it is their job to make good decisions. That is not the government's job. As a person who's been very active in politics, I probably know more lawmakers than most people, and I probably have a greater respect for folks in public office than some have only seen them from afar. But in my wildest dreams, I cannot imagine sending a son or daughter down to talk to my legislator about sex. Um, uh, not even you, Cher. <laughs> Uh, I have sent them to talk to our doctor, a wise friend, to a church group, to a comprehensive sex education class, and to Planned Parenthood, and it's worked out well. <laughs> On the other hand, it is ironic how badly the National Abstinence Only Initiative appears to be working out. Over the past 10 years, we have invested a billion dollars in the Abstinence Only program, it's pretty attractive to parents. It's a lot easier to just say no than to have those really uncomfortable conversations. Uh, but what has happened is that while we've been spending that money on abstinence on the education, uh, sexually transmitted diseases on the rise among young people and even uh, teen pregnancy is beginning to trend up. So, uh, just a couple other points. I have always followed the Roe versus Wade discussion in the Supreme Court, but until I read uh, Jeffrey Tubin's The Nine, a book I can recommend to all of you, I had no idea how much of the court's time was spent on the abortion issue. Uh, 
I think there are some other issues like free speech and public and uh, private corruption that could use some of that attention. And so one of the things I want from a president is someone who appoint jurists who um, have a broad understanding that while legislators deal with majority opinion and consensus, the courts have a special responsibility to protect minority rights. So I want a president who will elect, who will appoint jurists uh, who have respect for legal precedent and who are not extremists. My point of all of this is that America must relearn how to operate as a true democracy. I want a government that respects Americans in our glorious array of individual differences and holds our international relationships in the highest esteem. We must not be afraid to talk out loud about the issues, no matter how controversial. We must create an open environment for the national dialogue. That openness will unleash the energy and intellect of our people and encourage us to speak from our hearts. Then and only then will we bring the best of America to bear on the huge issues that confront us in fine ways to revive our economy, provide good health care for all our people, and cultivate civility at home and abroad. Thank you very much. Wow, thanks, Betty. That was, that was a vision. I have a feeling it's going to be a good evening. And next up, making it a great evening, is Jennifer Rawls. She's the executive director of the Tennessee Economic Council on Women, which is an institution I wish we had in Massachusetts. Um, prior to joining the council, she practiced law for more than 15 years and currently has a small practice focused on preparing wills and estates. She earned her Bachelor of Science degree in political science from Middle Tennessee State University and graduated from the University of Tennessee College of Law. She serves as an officer in Tower Toastmasters International Club and is the owner of the White Sands Communications, a motivational speaking and public speaking training company. She's also an avid writer and has co-authored a book about persistence called One Step from Striking Gold, which will be available at jenniferrawls.com very soon. And please welcome her, Jennifer Rawls. It is a great honor to be here today and talk about what women want. And I think what women want is economic self-sufficiency. Women understand that many, if not all, of the issues that we commonly talk about as women issues are at their very heart economic issues. Let me give you an example. Have you heard of the wage gap? Uh-huh. <laughs> Have you felt the wage gap? Uh -huh. Nationally and in Tennessee, the wage gap falls somewhere between 76 and 80 cents on the dollar. And what that means is for equal work, for equal time, for equal background, for equal title, for equal education, you are making about 76 cents on the dollar for what a man makes. Now, is that a fairness issue? Absolutely. Is it an economic issue? Equally important. Let's think about how Tennessee is funded. Sales tax important? You think closing that wage gap might make a difference to Tennessee's resources? And think about this, 80% of the buying decisions in the United States of America are made by women. That's right. You think that wage gap wouldn't change the way that we look at the purchases that we make and affect our overall national economy? Absolutely it would. So while we can talk about wage gap as far as numbers and cents and what we make and what we take home and how we use it. I also want you to think about this. We're not just talking about lower income wages. We're talking about all the way at the top. There was a very recent article, last week in fact, in the Fortune Magazine online about the highest paid women and men CEOs. The highest paid women CEO in the United States of America is Sherilyn Gassaway of Alltel. Her take home pay last year was $38.6 million. That's what, about what I make for working in a state agency, by the way. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. <laughs> On the other hand, we have Steve Schwartzman of the Blackstone Group. His annual salary last year was $350.7 million. 
Now, while we all were saying, wow, you go Sherilyn with your $37, $38 million a year, Mr. Schwartzman, who is the number one paid man in America, CEO in America, according to Fortune.com, uh, makes over nine times what Ms. Gassaway makes. But it's not just about take home pay. Nationally, studies indicate that fewer than 15% of corporate boards have seats filled by women. In Tennessee, a state that I'm very proud to call home, we made half that mark. 7.3% of the public owned companies in Tennessee have seats filled by women. Other issues like domestic violence and education and preventative health care, which are typically discussed as social issues, are vitally important to our economic progress and self-sufficiency. The economic costs of domestic violence alone are staggering. And when you realize that the CDC estimates that one in three families are, one in three families are affected by domestic violence, just think about the amount of money that we're talking about. It's great that we're here at Vanderbilt's campus, and thank you, Stacy, for welcoming us all here. Uh, we talk about our education generally in terms of our children. We talk about programs for our kids to make sure they can read and write, and all of that is vitally important. It's necessary, and it's one of the basic jobs that I think sets America apart from other countries in the world. But there are also a lot of non-traditional students out there, women who have gone back to college after taking a break. And you know, the one thing that we advise these women is to keep going, keep plugging, because you're doing the one thing that can change your economic status. We have to recognize the impact that their educational success has on our economy. The bottom line, friends, is that when you affect a woman's economic status, either positively or negatively, you affect her family. And it doesn't really matter what her family looks like. She may be taking care of her parents at home. She may be taking care of her children. She may be married, single, divorced. She may have chosen a life partner, or she may have a family of friends that she's chosen. But for the vast majority of women, how you encourage and support her efforts towards economic self-sufficiently will have a far greater impact than on her life alone. A couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to participate in an event here in Nashville for women, and we had some posters up that talked about economic indicators in women in Tennessee. And there was a woman who just stared at one fact, and it was the median income for Tennessee women at that point, which was around $27,000. And she stood there just staring and staring and staring, and finally I could get away from, from our booth, and I went up and, and struck up a conversation with her, and she said, you know, I work two jobs, and I don't make near $27,000. And I said, um, I said, I know, it's tough. And, and you're not the only person who I hear that from. And she said, but I'm doing something about it. And I said, that's great, what are you doing? And she said, I'm going to school. And I said, that is exactly what we would tell you to do to increase your earnings opportunities. Because we know that a high school graduate, uh, uh, sorry, a high school dropout in Tennessee makes about $15,000 a year. And the more education you attain, the higher it goes up, right? So I was encouraging her to do that. And she said, I feel really good about that decision. But I'll tell you, with four kids at home by myself, it's tough. And I said, no doubt. No doubt. You know, the next time I hear somebody say, can women have it all, I want to tell them, look, most women have got more than they want to have to deal with. <laughs> And that woman is a perfect example, and you can find her in every city, in every community, in every place in this great state. Economic self-sufficiency may be a dream for some and a goal for others, but if we're going to move our country ahead, we have to pay attention to women's economic issues. Women make up more than 50% of our population. Women outregister and outvote men. Women will soon make up more than 50% of our labor force. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, by 2014, more than 50% of the United States labor, labor force sorry, will be women. Women generally have a longer life expectancy than men. Women, in Tennessee at least, make up more than 50% of the enrollment in our state's universities and colleges. I don't think it's asking too much that women's voices are heard more than 50% of the time. Thank you all again for having me. It's a great event. Thank you very much.
you so much, Jennifer. Wow, I, uh, I'm liking Nashville. <laughs> I'm feeling it. All right. Um, next up, we're going to welcome Judith Biondo Meeker, who began sending quilts from her fourth grade classroom to Afghanistan in 2001 with Peaceful Tomorrow families who lost loved ones on September 11th. Continuing to make quilts and asking students to open their hearts to others, Judith, with the help of her friends, has worked with over 12,000 students in sending quilts to Afghanistan, Iraq, Bethlehem, Zambia, Lebanon, South Africa, slave children survivors from Indian rug factories and Ghanaian fishing villages, China and Tibet, three countries of genocide, Rwanda, Sudan, and our own Native Americans in the Indian land of the Northwest, over 45 countries to date. After looking at pictures growing up near the first Gulf War, near depleted uranium bomb hits, children with blind, bulging cataract eyes, Judith joined a few unreasonable women, which is what we're trying to be here tonight, sitting and camping at the White House, which began code pink. Judith is still working for nonviolence, working with children to open their hearts, and making quilts to ship those in need of caring and compassion. And I can't wait to hear what she wants for the next president. Please welcome Judith Bianca Meeker. Well, she's kind of said it all, so um, I work with kids, and, um, and when I was teaching at Granberry here in Brentwood, I asked them to open their hearts to children in Afghanistan. Um, I heard thousands of people were freezing to death, and they continue to be freezing to death every year. Uh, almost 30 years of war. And we just couldn't even comprehend that. But we sent our quilts within six weeks. Our quilts were uh, shown in Kabul University. They were given away. And a letter came back from a high school student saying, um, thank you for the wonderful quilts. Um, we are so sorry about September 11th. The same thing has happened in our country for more than 20 years. Uh, please, do, uh, we have lost our brothers, our sisters, our parents. Please do not forget us. That is a haunting letter. It, it changed all of us. Uh, I ask in children to open their hearts to uh, people around the world um, and to learn about them. Well, I had no idea the kind of things we were going to learn from such a simple thing of drawing with fabric markers and writing letters from their heart and looking on maps and learning how to spell Afghanistan. Within a few months, we were sending quilts to Palestinians. I met a Christian peacekeeper who, uh, nearby here, she came to visit, and she uh, flies into, she was flying into uh, Israel every few months, and she would ask the soldiers to stop fighting, literally coming in from the airport, and she would walk the teacher and the kids home from school, and then they would start fighting again. Well, I was so moved. I said, you know, we've just sent 12 quilts to Afghanistan, and she said, honey, you don't understand your quilts will be hope. Bethlehem is rubble. Well, that was shocking. You know, some things just seemed more and more shocking that year. And uh, by summer, we were sending quilts to, from uh, children in North Nashville to Africa. And they were talking about violence in their neighborhoods and how they couldn't sleep at night here in Nashville. And uh, that was amazing. We were talking about child soldiers in Africa, and they started talking about violence. And we thought, oh, we have to do something here. Um, the newspaper picked it up and started writing about why are the kids in Nashville can't sleep at night because of gunfire. So uh, we just kept making quilts. 2002, September 11th, I was in Afghanistan making quilts with five schools for a country that was rumored to be our new enemy, Iraq. So we started doing that. Uh, pretty soon I got asked to make quilts for children freed from slavery in India. So we did that. And each time we got pictures back, a lot of the times, so and we have beautiful pictures, which we put on our website, we bring to the schools, and we tell the children about these issues, which breaks their heart, and then they open them more, and they draw beautiful pictures, and reach out farther. And we just kept continuing to do this, and networking with uh, 12 to 13,000 children. So that's kind of the things we've been working on on the sidelines, wishing I had more time to to, you know, deal with slavery and all kinds of things, but um, uh, we just keep working. And the things that we care about are the same things we ask the kids to care about. You know, people and um, 
Our children now, I'm back teaching, I'm working out near Napier Homes, interestingly enough, a full circle to where we're in the homes, near the homes with the same children that live in the violence that can't sleep at night. And um, making quilts with them and they're talking about it again. And they're opening their heart to other people around the world um, who are growing up in violence. And, uh, but they have such beautiful smiles on their faces. And these children now have grown up in war themselves. They have known nothing but war in their lifetime, which is amazing. Amazing that that's the case. So I would like the, the courage, I would like um, people to have the courage to be nonviolent, to have the, to be, allow people to have conversations, to have synergistic happenings so we can be smarter and find answers and do things about things. Uh, yesterday I found out that each one of us owes $33,000 um, because of our national debt. I have seven in my family, I have a new granddaughter. We can't afford that. Uh, and I like to say these weren't my choices, but it doesn't make any difference. We're paying for it. We're gonna to have to pay for it. We're gonna to have to figure it out. And we're gonna to have to figure out how can we really um, stop this and really care about people around the world and ourselves, of course. Of course, that's all part of it, isn't it? I mean, we need to care about ourselves enough. Uh, I, I would like officials who have dignity for themselves and for others, right? Yeah. So, I don't know if I have anything else to say. I think we're really just starting a conversation. So, <laughs> um, thank you very much. Thank you, Judith, and thanks for all the work that you continue doing and have done. Um, our next speaker is actually being interviewed by the media at the moment, which is part of the point of this event. So um, while that's happening, I'm going to go over the ground rules of the open mic, which is going to happen after we hear from Representative Sherry Jones, who will be back with us in a minute. So basically, um, get to thinking what, if you could have Obama and McCain's attention for three minutes, what would you tell them? What would you ask of them? That is the question you get to answer here at this microphone. Um, we have a few ground rules. Civil discourse, no hate speech. Everybody play like adults, that's the number one. Um, two is please stay on topic. Um, so for example, I wish that the fashion industry would make clothes in a wider range of sizes. That's not on topic, because that's not something that the next president can do much about. <laughs> so you sort of think about what your topic is. Um, three minutes is your time. Uh, I will let you know when you're running up on that time. We're only going to be asking women to the microphone um, because of the nature of the project, although we're glad to have men here listening and hearing. Um, I feel like I'm probably missing something, but that's, that's the nugget of it. Oh, and before you speak, you're going to need to see me to briefly sign a waiver that says you know that we're going to be putting this on YouTube and that it could wind up, you know, on the nightly news, which is actually who's interviewing our next speaker at the moment. So, um, you know what, I think that while she's talking, I would say let's go ahead and have people who want to speak the open mic come on up and then when she's done, we'll bring her up. So, who would like to do some speaking to the presidential candidates? All right, let me get my uh, uh, waivers and you can get the Let me introduce Representative Sherry Jones, <laughs> who just did uh, an interview on our behalf, which is fabulous. Um, Representative Stacey Jones was born in Nashville. Sherry. Sherry, I'm sorry. I'm a little discombobulated. I know the interview did that to you. Yeah. <laughs> You're probably used to that. But <laughs> yes, you can be. Yeah. Um, she is a House member of the 99th through 105th General Assemblies, Vice Chair of the House Children and Family Affairs Committee, um, Chair of the House Domestic Relations Subcommittee, Chair of the Joint Select Committee on Children and Youth, and the Davidson County Delegation. Um, she's a member of a whole bunch of other subcommittees and committees. She's honestly so accomplished that I cannot read you her whole bio. Um, <laughs> she is involved with the National Women's Political Caucus the Davidson County Democratic Women. She's a volunteer for the court-appointed special advocate CASA office. 
She's um, a member of the Committee on Housing Solutions for Mental Health, uh, the member of the Tennessee Coalition Against Domestic Violence, uh, and the Metro Nashville Planning Commission, and um, has been awarded, looks like, just about anything that you could award this lady. <laughs> Uh, including the Vanderbilt Law School Leadership Award, the Tennessee Podiatric, po Podiatric Medical Association Legislator of the Year Award, the Tennessee Firefighters Legislator of the Year Award, the Senior Citizens Leadership of the Year Award, and the list goes on and on. Please welcome Representative Sherry Jones. I'm so tired from all the things that I do. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm so accomplished. It's just. <laughs> I want to say thank you so much to Vanderbilt, to Stacy, and Jacqueline for having us here today and for having this event. And uh, I know that this is the first time we've done it, and I hope that it gets bigger and better every time there's an election and more and more women show up and begin to really stand up and let politicians know what they need, what they want. Because if you don't do that, you're not gonna get what you need and you're not gonna get what you want. Um, as um, a House member in the Tennessee General Assembly, I work with women's issues and children's issues most of all. I am, um, I'm busy all of the time with issues that affect those two groups of people. I also do a lot of things with working people and with health care. And I can tell you from my experience that there are a lot of bad things that happen to women and to children especially. Um, in the um, Tennessee General Assembly, to let you know that um, women are still second class citizens, we really don't have a woman chair of a standing committee. All of the things that I chair are special committees or subcommittees because we don't have a woman that chairs in the uh, House, which I find unbelievable almost. Um, most. Most everything that I believe I have to say has really been said by the speakers before me. Betty's been there, she knows, you know, what we work on and what we have to do. I do have to say that we have tried on numerous occasions to raise the minimum wage here in the state of Tennessee. And we have found it impossible to do. Because not only do men not want to do it, but some women don't want to do it either. And who would think that a woman would be voting against something that enables women to do better in their lives? But they do. Um, insurance is a really difficult issue in the state of Tennessee. We have so many adults and children that are not covered by insurance. If your child breaks an arm and you don't have insurance, what do you do? If your child is really sick, what do you do if you don't have insurance? A lot of kids just don't go to the doctor, they just don't go to the hospital. And that is, that's, that's horrible. That's horrible. There's not a child living that should not be able to get appropriate health care from this state or from this nation. Um, I had a little boy that came to me who was one of five children who had been chained to his bed, and a lot of you probably saw it in the paper. He was chained to his bed, and he was almost starved to death. He had his other siblings, I think, one or two of them were older and then two were younger. They had every one been sexually abused and physically abused. When our Department of Children's Services finally went to interview, they didn't find anything wrong. And finally, after many, many calls from family members and calling the police, they finally got somebody in there to check on that child who was close to death. He was premature and had a lot of um, medical issues to start with, but by the time we got to him as the state, he was almost gone, almost gone. And his siblings are still, at, well, are not now, but they were still in a position where they were living with 
the perpetrators. Now, the stepmother just got out of prison. I think she did three or four years on that, and the father is probably coming out sometime soon. We don't do right by children in this state or in this nation, and we need to do better. If you have children that go through those issues, they develop mental health problems, issues, and we don't address those. We don't see to it that those children get the care that they need to become productive citizens. And it is sad, the things that we do. We have, um, which is a fairly new to me in the General Assembly, issues where moms are having their children taken away from them because they don't have the money to fight in court for custody when there's a big battle. And so they wind up not being able to win and to have their children live with them. And in some instances, the father has been accused of either physical or sexual abuse. But that doesn't seem to make a difference in a lot of instances. Our economy is so bad now. It is just unbelievable. Our environment needs to be cleaned up. We need, um, as a member of the uh, Tennessee Coalition Against Domestic Violence, we look at domestic violence issues all the time. And it's hard to take somebody who is an abuser and change them so that they no, no longer feel compelled to beat up their wife or their children. It just doesn't happen that often. Um, we also have a lot of instances where um, members, uh, family members, where, where the, the original family comes from another country, they come over here, and then the children are citizens, they're born here, but then they're forced into marriage. They still are doing the, the forcing, you know, the arranged marriages, and we're having girls come to us on a regular basis who are citizens, don't want that marriage. They don't know the person. They've never met the person. They've met him once. And we've tried in many instances to um, find them places to go and somewhere else to be where they feel safe because they're afraid that their family's going to kill them. So we, my staff, as a matter of fact, has taken some home with her <laughs> because we just, we don't have places for these women, for these girls. So. What do women and girls really want from a new president? We want freedom to choose whether or not or when we have children. We want protection from domestic violence. We want health care available to adults and to all children. And we want quality mental health available to children and to adults. We want our lives to matter. We don't want to be forced into anything that we don't want to do. We want good jobs with the same pay. We want a healthy environment. We want to stop human trafficking of women and children, which is coming more to the forefront here in Tennessee. And where my office is working on that. You would think we would have a million people in my office, but we don't, there's just a few of us. <laughs> we want quality education. And we want the press to quit beating up on public education. There are so many good people involved in public education, good teachers, people that care, and it doesn't do anybody any good service to continually beat up on our public education system. We don't want to live in poverty. Give us the means and we will make our way. And when we make our way, we will make the way for our families. When we do well, our families do well. We want the war to end. We are tired of sending our children, our babies, into a war to be killed. We don't want to see our brothers, our sisters, our moms, our dads, our aunts, our uncles, husbands, or wives, any of those sent to a war to be killed that we probably shouldn't be in anyway. We need that to end. 
we, I do believe in a strong military that protects us here at home, not that goes off and tries to fight everybody in the world because that really doesn't work out very well. We want our country to be at peace. Um, like other speakers have said, we want respect and we want women to vote. We don't want women to vote for a woman just because she's a woman. We want women to vote for good women candidates that believe in the same things that we do. We want sex education so abortion numbers will drop. We want human rights for everybody. And my uh, granddaughter, who's been going to the polls with me since she was about five months old, she's been coming downtown to the plaza with me since she was younger than that. She knows her way around everywhere. When she goes with me now, she's like, I'm gonna go see Carol. I'm gonna, and she runs off to go, because she's been coming up there since she was nine years old. When I ask her, what she wanted from a new president. She said, and this just kind of sums everything up, she said, I want a new president. <laughs> so, thank you all very much for having me here tonight. I enjoy it. Thank you so much, Representative Jones. Thanks for being here. All right, so, uh, the open mic is about to get underway. And if you would like to speak at it, you should line up near that mic so that I can get you signed off before you speak. And Elizabeth, yeah. if you're all set, you can come on over here. And anyone else who wants to speak, I'm going to meet you right over there. So you're three minutes away, too. All right. Well, I'm also uh, helping with the uh, d alternative debate tonight and want to make sure that everybody knows how to get there afterwards. It's <clears throat> one of the things that we're doing that for is because we want to hear all the voices so that we can have real input on the kind of decisions that we make. When we're so limited, as the corporations are doing to two parties, it limits our ability to hear everybody. So we're trying to let as many people speak out as possible. <clears throat> I'm the uh, chair of the Tennessee Editorial Board of the American Forum. And one of the things that we're working on very hard is to get more women into the media. And so I'd really like to uh, ask you to send me articles of things that you're interested in. The articles that we send out go out to the entire state. And uh, we're looking for articles from women. And so, uh, you can talk to me later to get my contact information. Also, you saw up here that we have an I Miss America pageant tomorrow. We'd like to invite everyone to come. I'm also the uh, Middle Tennessee coordinator for Code Pink, and Judy told you all about that. One of the things that, uh, well, I have two things in my three minutes. Um, this is my granddaughter. She's too adorable to owe so much money that she's going to owe when she gets to be 18. So I want uh, the arcane uh, financial boondoggles to get straightened out without uh, the taxpayer having to carry the burden of the criminals who've stolen all this money that we have to pay back. That just doesn't make sense to me. And the other thing that I want from the uh, president is you know, we've killed over a million Iraqis in this illegal, immoral, terrible, uh, oh, anyway, don't get me started as my daughter says. Um, one of the things that we've been doing, we send our babies to kill their babies. It's against everything that we believe in. Uh, you know, uh, Judy talked about Mother's Day. And uh, we have to know that these are our neighbors that we're killing. And that, the, for example, the depleted uranium, 
that we're bombing down there, our children are bringing that home in their bodies. And that uranium is blowing all over. It has a half-life of 4 point billion, billion years. That means that it's not going to wear out before we do. And so I wanted to read, I'm a poet also. <laughs> in my three months, I mean my three minutes. It's just, yeah, we've got, we've got right out of time. just about out of time. Yeah, well, this is a very short poem. Okay. I have long poems, but this is my short one. It's not in this one. <laughs> well, that's okay. I'm about out of time. Anyway, we have to be concerned for the people all around the world. This is, this is our brothers and sisters all around the world. I want the next president to realize that we don't have to be mean to Iran. There's really good people there. I hated the... Uh, Implications when Obama says, "Oh, you know, BJ gave that bad speech in the in the uh, United Nations." It wasn't a bad speech. I, I don't like to hear any of our candidates echoing uh, the uh, present president, resident, who was, uh, you know, that they stole stole it. So, anyway. I had such a good ending here. <laughs> but I have, I have uh, flyers for the uh, I Miss America pageant. You know, I miss habeas corpus. I miss freedom. I miss choice. You're not going to miss me. <laughs>my resume isn't as impressive as all those before me. I'm just a student. Um, and I have two concerns. Um, as a child of an immigrant who had the opportunity to, to legally immigrate here, I'm concerned about the discourse that's going on about immigration. And what I'm concerned about is the fact that we are a nation of laws, but we are also a nation of immigrants. And um, I just need to know, I just want our president to speak about a safe and legal way for our immigrants to come into the country, a way that's cleaner and more expedient than what we have right now. Number two, um, as a student who is about to take on massive loans for our graduate schools, I am concerned about agencies like Sally Mae, who I consider predatory, and who are, who are um, going to make me pay a hefty toll for my desire for an education, and who are gonna make me choose when I graduate between a job that I care deeply about and a job that's for profit. So, um, I need, I'm not asking for a handout, I'm just asking for um, a way to repay my loans that aren't ballooning as I get older. So that's it. How's everyone doing? Uh, my name's Erica Santiago. I am co-president of Vanderbilt Feminist here on Vanderbilt's campus. I am a junior, and I'm from New York City, so it's been very different for me to come from New York and come to Nashville. But what's really interesting is not only on this college campus, but in many college campuses, there's problems called acquaintance rape. And I think that this is an issue that I think our candidates need to really speak about. I think that the media plays a large, large role in blaming the victims of crimes. When women are seen as the person that knew the rapist, it is incorrect. The rapist knew their victim. The way that it's seen in the paper and the way that it's seen in the media is what's wrong. And I believe that the candidates can both speak about how women really do have the power to show that the men is the one that, has the, that made that mistake that night. That man, that rapist, that person that did that. We cannot continue to tell women that if you do this, this, and this, and this, then nothing's gonna happen. Because if that, the only way to make that stop is if for the man to know that they're not gonna do that that evening. And I think that 
being from New York, being, and then coming here to Nashville and seeing that the same issues are there from here, college campuses everywhere, because I really think it's, it is everywhere, but I really feel it on a college campus when it depends if someone's walking someone back to their room or someone's just going out somewhere and then it ends up really bad. And I think that a lot of times that we're just really, really too busy blaming what was she wearing and what was she doing compared to the fact of what he was planning on doing earlier that evening compared to what he was planning on doing that night and how he took advantage of a situation at that moment. And I think that it's something that the pre presidential candidates should really, really bring up because that is us, that is women, and that is our male allies that do so much that are correct. Our male allies that are working to help women are seen as, as horrible people when they're the ones that are planning ahead to never ever be in a situation like that. And they're the ones planning ahead to make sure that their friends will never put a woman in a situation like that. And we need to respect and love them just as much as we respect and love our women. So thank you so much all. I know there are some shy people sitting in the audience right now who have something to say. So I'm going to give you a minute to pull yourself together and get up here. Excellent. I'm Lauren Beekman, and I'm vice president of an organization that works with Stacey Nunnally called The Life Project. And we're dedicated to women's empowerment. We work with high school girls in Nashville. So we're dedicated to getting them to events like this and to be advocates for whatever's in their heart. Um, and I am also but a lowly college student. But my challenge to anybody who wants to be president of the United States of America is to realize that they are president of the United States of America. They're not president of their own agenda. They're not president of Congress. They're not president of, of white people or of black people. And I don't want to be seen as a black woman. I want to be seen as an American. So I want my interest or anyone else I know's interest to matter just as much as mine. And I know coming from where I come from, for a black woman to be at a school like Vanderbilt University is not typical. Most of the people I knew in high school, um, if they went to college, they're not there anymore. So instead of blaming those people, saying that those people are lazy, when I've known those people to be working you know, three jobs for their entire life and they don't have any retirement, I want to return on the things that presidents are promising in their campaigns. I want you to realize that if you're going to promise me you know, equal education, or if you're gonna promise me equal pay, that you have to give it to me, or I'm gonna stand at your door and I'm going to beat it down until you give it to me. <laughs> because I'm an aggressive person. And I think, I think that we need more aggressive people in, in this nation that are not willing to sit back while a few people make decisions that affect all of us. And I think that it's, it's very important that I've heard quite a few candidates, um, not just, you know, the actual nominees, but candidates who are trying to run, you know, and just didn't quite make it there to the Republican or Democratic nomination, um, that they've, you know, quoted biblical scriptures. And the most notable one that I can think of that comes to mind is, um, whatever you've done for the least of these, you've done for me. And it's, it's something that Jesus says in Matthew. And I want them to know that whatever they've done for the lowliest American, the American with the least amount of money that's in the least, that has the least advantages, you know, growing up, is what they've done for all of us. You know, issues are not black, they're not white, they're not poor, they're not rich. Issues are American issues. And they really have to stand for each individual in this country. And that is why we are a democracy. Good evening, my name is Laura McNeil and about 14 years ago I was a student at Vanderbilt. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, um, you know, really 
two things that I would, you know, sit and, and talk with um, Obama and McCain about are, one, we need to become energy independent. I really and truly believe that. And, you know, I think it's, we need to have a, a plan that's, you know, beyond electric cars, hybrid cars, beyond wind. I mean, it needs to be a, a fundamental approach to how we live our lives, both in our homes, in our businesses. So we need to, um, to put a plan in place. So that would be uh, number one. Um, but then the, the other thing is, is um, you know, I, one of the things that, you know, I sit down and talk to my friends, you know, if I were president, you know, the, this is what I would do. And one of those things is I would, um, I would want to implement some sort of program that um, is around civic responsibility. And so I would ask them, you know, what is your plan for, for civic responsibility? And so part of the vision that I have is that, you know, between high school and college, every American spends a year giving back to the United States. Uh, if you think about all the time that we spend in front of the TV and, you know, we're just sort of captivated by media. It's like, why can't we be captivated by being an American and captivated by giving back? And, you know, I think particularly, you know, when we're at Vanderbilt and you look around and, you know, this wonderful education that's made possible, there's so much behind that and why can't we just give back? And so I'd really encourage that, you know, Obama and McCain think about a plan for, um, you know, giving back to the community, you know, whether it's something very structured or, you know, whether it's encouraging everyone to, you know, spend a Saturday afternoon instead of in front of the TV, spend it outside, you know, whether it's cleaning up, whether it's volunteering, something. And um, so those are kind of my two issues, so thanks. <laughs> This is your last call. <laughs> Come on up. To go on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm a little bit sick. Um, I guess I believe I have two issues that I would like to talk about. Um, one comes from my home, and I come from a medical family that's been involved with the community. And it's so frustrating to see people coming to the hospital or being afraid to come to the hospital and they're not able to pay their bills, and people say, well, the doctors are making so much money, but doctors have been seeing premium insurance rates increasing by 90, 100% in some areas in a year. Um, so it's not just the doctors, it's a whole system, and so seeing people falling out of the system like that, it really affects my family. And another thing, um, as far as climate change and energy issues, please stop saying I believe or I do not believe in climate science. It is not a religion, it is <laughs> science. <laughs> I mean, as someone who studies science, you know that scientists say it is not a fact until you prove it a thousand times. Until you go through it methodically over and over again, you have hundreds of people telling you, no, it's wrong, and you prove it's right over and again. And so when you're talking about climate change and all of these issues, you also have to consider the social justice that's going to come behind it. I heard, I read a report, I think it was from 2004, and it was done by um, an independent think tank for Washington talking about the largest national security issue that we're facing. And it was climate change. And it was talking about how to handle the people that are going to be needing another country to go to, the resources that are going to be depleted, water, nitrogen for crops, uh, and phosphorus crops as well. Um, I mean, just in weather patterns, it goes on and on. And so when talking about climate issues, I'd like to hear something besides just energy, because while that's a huge issue, you also have to consider who's going to fall through the cracks.
Um, I want increased funding for education in Tennessee. Um, and I know we're talking to the presidential candidates, but I'm from Tennessee, so I'm a little biased. Um, and I, so this, the teachers and um, others who work the school system are given the tools to help all children reach their potential, um, including children with mental health issues um, and special needs children. <clears throat> And also, I think that when kids get what they need at school, that um, keeps them from entering the juvenile justice system. Um, and the second thing that I want is free birth control. I want free birth control. Um, and probably most women do. Um, logically, I think that ultimately it could save money um, when unwanted pregnancies might, that could possibly lead to higher use of welfare assistance. Not that I have a problem with welfare assistance, I think it's great. Um, and also it could help prevent unwanted abortions because that's a tough decision for anybody. My name is Nikita Jones, and um, mine is really brief. Um, I've heard both candidates talk about their plans for education, and while they might be great in some people's eyes, my biggest issue is that it doesn't solve the public education problem. In this respect, we still have schools failing, and we've heard from the representative that spoke that um, the media has characterized public education as this big horrible thing. And so I would like to see a revamp in public education that provides the best level across the board of quality education while still maintaining states' rights. Um, so that's my, my hoorah issue. Thank you. <laughs> All right, well, I uh, want to thank you all. You've been a fabulous group. I want to really encourage you to pick up bookmarks in the back. Please take as many as you can possibly distribute to encourage women to speak out online and to vote on each other's ideas online. It's a real participatory venue. Um, if you want a whole stack of them, I've got more in my bag. Um, also, please sign up for our mailing list. We'll let you know when the video from this is live and um, about how the rest of the speak outs are going and uh, if and when we get the candidates to listen to us. Um, so we'll keep you updated on the project. Um, again, I wanna thank everyone who made this possible and uh, keep speaking out. I know this probably wasn't the start for most of you and I hope it won't be the stop. So thanks for being here, good night.